Good morning, everybody. Welcome, dear friends and colleagues, to the European Cities Marketing Webinar. I take the opportunity to announce that after 33 years of uh, continuity, the ECM Summer School is changing its pace. It will go virtual and we will be evolving into an executive dialogue for advanced professionals of the meeting industry. For the newcomers, uh, we have in mind a mentoring program due to be launched in September. The summer school will take place virtually from 24th to the 26th of August and it will be touching relevant elements of the evolution of the meeting industry after the COVID-19 outbreak. Our top experts uh, of the faculty will lead you through the uh, main themes, uh, three main themes from the meeting industry affected by the crisis and its repercussions expected to stay in the future as well. The first day is dedicated to the strategic outlook of the industry with a closer look to the role of the CVBs and their relation to the clients. The, day, the second day will be a deep dive into the complex world of clients and suppliers. The last day will give you an insight of our slow but steady process and perspective of sustainable and smart recovery. The webinar of today is uh, a little anticipation of the complex world we are facing and I will pass the floor to my friend Miguel Neres. Thank you very much for your attention and enjoy your webinar. Perfect there, Paolo. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. I can see that there's quite a few joining us already. We have a, a quite, I hope you'll find a very interesting webinar today. My name is Miguel Neves. I'm Chief Social Strategist at uh, Miguel7.com. I am one of the faculty members from the European Cities Marketing uh, Summer School. And I'm really happy to have everybody here. And I just wanted to get a, a hello from everybody. Um, and I can see that a few people are already writing in the chat, and that's exactly what I was going to invite you to do. There's 53, 56 people currently attending, plus our eight panelists. I'd love you to add where you're watching from in the chat and maybe give a hello to everybody else who's watching from all over the world. I see a few familiar faces. We have Pascal here from Geneva. We have Suzanne Singleton from UK London. Suzanne, thank you for joining us. Kai Troll from Brussels. Charlotte from Leeds. Excellent. There's everybody's coming in and saying hello. I can't keep up with everybody's uh, destination, but it's really nice to see people from all over the world. Uh, if you have any special messages from where you are, um, great to see. There's somebody from Lisbon, Pedro Pereira, another Portuguese person. Excellent to see that. And I hope you also like to see the, the other where everybody else is um, talking from here in the chat. So excellent. That's also a, a, a great way to start off to uh, to say hello to everybody else. Hi, Natasha from the south coast of England. Um, you're now using the chat, which is one of the functions that we are going to be using throughout the webinar. The other one is the Q&A. You should see two buttons, the chat button and the Q&A. Uh, the chat button is exactly for this, for you to say hello, uh, for you to make comments, for you to talk to other people. And you can also chat to individual people if you want, not just to everybody, but we recommend that you chat with everybody. It makes it much more interesting for everyone. The Q&A section is where we'd like you to ask these specific questions for the speakers. So as the speakers go through their session, if you have any questions, any comments, or anything that they, you'd like them to address afterwards, please add them in the Q&A section because it makes it very easy for us to manage. And the other thing is if you have a question or if you see a question in the Q&A, that somebody else has asked, but you really want to know the answer to that question, you can upvote as well. So you can press the little thumbs up button. And that means that question comes up to the top and it makes it really easy for us um, as um, the speakers and the panelists to uh, select the most important questions and make sure that we address those. We're going to have a uh, questions uh, Q&A section at the end of the whole event uh, to really you know, make it as interactive as possible. But if there are any burning questions, anything that comes up in the chat that's really important, we will ask the speakers to address those right after uh, they start. The first um, two speakers that will be joining us are Matthias Sonnerman, uh, who you might already be able to see. Matthias, if you're there, give us a wave. There you go. And Silke Laurman as well. Very good. Uh, they are both uh, from SAP. Matthias is the Senior Director, Head of Events, Events Programs and Experience. And Silke is Category Procurement Manager for Marketing and Travel at SAP. And their session is called Strategy and Purchasing Changes for Corporate Clients. 
And I'd like to now hand over to Matthias and Silke to take over the screen do their presentation. And they're gonna be talking for about 10 minutes. Uh, we will have time maybe to address questions if there's anything really um, important. But if not, please do uh, enter those questions in the Q&A section and we'll get to a larger Q&A at the end of the three presentations. So over to you, Silke and Matthias. Thank you very much, Miguel. Um, I hope everybody can see my screen. I see Miguel nodding and yeah, thumbs up, great. Um, welcome everybody um, from our side as well, um, from SAP. And since we just have 10 minutes, um, we just, go into it without a lot of introduction. Um, this is the one slide I think I have to show in every presentation. For those who don't know SAP, we're an, a software um, company uh, with more than 440,000 customers all over the world. Um, 100,000 employees, more than almost 28 billion euros revenue. Uh, and in fact, currently some of the, you know, one of the not so much affected companies uh, by the COVID-19 situation, uh, we were able to actually in, uh, increase our revenue and um, and profit uh, in the first quarter by by nine percent because of the digitization going on um, or being accelerated. So moving on into the events world that we're talking about right now, and just to level set, um, SAP produces or used to produce uh, more than two thousand events every year, uh, which we do in three different tiers. Um, tier one is our top um, and global uh, event category, the one that the team that I'm working in is responsible for. Then we have a larger number of regional events, um, about 200 with a focus on specific regions. Uh, and then the last tier is all the local events in specific countries, um, all the industry events, also smaller meetings, customer meetings, etc., of which we run about 2,000 every year. So. Um, I think that's enough of an introduction to understand roughly where we're coming from. Um, but as you all know, the situation has changed dramatically. Um, we are currently underway to develop a new um, event strategy. And what I want to show you a little bit is the basic assumptions that we're applying in development of this strategy and our outlook um, over the next two plus years uh, in this situation. Let's future cast. We are currently in the now section of this slide on the very left. Um, now it's fast reaction to physical threat. And in fact, um, the SAP members of the board have uh, decided in uh, April to actually cancel all physical events for this company for the remainder of the year. So that required a, a sudden and very fast reaction to move everything that we used to do physically to an online world. And honestly, this organization that Dirk and I are working for has heavily depended, has heavily depended on sales or for sales on physical events to actually uh, make customer connections, uh, generate leads, uh, accelerate pipeline and, and deal closing. So now all of this online. You might have recently seen uh, our first larger event online, at Sapphire Now, um, with 125,000 participants online. And um, the, the other big one coming up in October, November this year is SAP TechEd, uh, our technical event. That's also going to be virtual and for which we're working on the online experience. Um, but what we really expect to see, and that's I think important to everybody on this on this call right now, is the next phase is, uh, of transformation. So what we're considering right now is based on the different geographies, different speeds and needs to actually physically meet a hybrid model. Um, we already see in some regions of the world like uh, Asia, China, some you know, parts of China, et cetera, the reopening has started. Uh, and there's again an urge for physical meetings. So the hybrid model that we're seeing is for now, for us means we're going to have a, phys a digital, digital first presence. So the main way to get um, um, our content over to the audience is going to be virtual, but complemented with smaller physical meetings where possible from 2021 on. The rollout of that um, is going to take longer throughout 2021 and probably into 2022. Um, 
our assumption is that maybe even through the first half of 2021, not all parts of the world will, will be able to do um, physical events, even in small size, again. So, but slowly over 2021 and 2022, we expect to continue and expand our hybrid model. So hybrid, in our, in our opinion, is not going to go away, but physical events slowly growing larger. The final consideration for 2022 plus is the scale, the scale. So the question is, do we need large events at the size of which we had 20, 30,000 still in our industry? Um, the hybrid event model is going to prevail um, and we will be able to much better organize the physical experiences complementing a hybrid, uh, sorry, a digital experience um, in specific areas and regions of the world with relevant content, um, speakers and attendees. And with that, I'm handing it over to Silke Lauermann for her part of purchasing and our joint considerations in working with CVBs and others. Many thanks, Matthias. Um, so hello and welcome everybody. Um, so as it is my first time being um, part of this um, event, I would like to introduce briefly myself. So my name is Silke Lauermann. I'm um, in SAP's Global Procurement Organization, where I'm the strategic lead for marketing events in the regions EMEA and APJ. Um, we have 10 procurement experts who are focusing on events globally and managing the spend of roughly 3,000 event suppliers. Amongst those event suppliers, we have CVBs, hotels, venues, event agencies, technical suppliers, and technology suppliers. Um, with about 10 to 15 CVBs in EMEA, we have a long-term relationship where we engage on a regular basis. And for all other venues, it's more um, an engagement of based on a one-off um, project. 50% of the overall event spend is allocated in Americas, 40% in EMEA and 10% um, in APJ. So the key priorities for us in procurement is really to support our lines of business, so the events team, in executing their strategies. And as Matthias said, this might change now due to COVID-19 and in future. So we want to support them in selecting the best-in-class vendors and satisfying their business needs, basically. And procurement is the single point of contact for all financial topics. So we have a legal department and tax and insurance departments and data protection, but we are the go-to person for our lines of business to provide consolidated um, solutions and feedback. Um, yeah, I think this is basically it. Thank you. <laughs> um, in, in this slide, we collected the event implications um, due to COVID-19, and um, we thought it might be interesting to share some of those reflections with you. So, um, from a financial perspective, we see risks and opportunities with the current situation. So, on the one side, the budget and the revenue decreased um, for virtual events, but on the other side, um, the, the expenditure has been um, decreased as well, so we can really save money for, um, for stationary and logistic services. So there is really an opportunity to save some money. Um, in terms of customer experience, of course, we have a, a greater range and um, we can really, we have a possibility to continuously approach our customers with a more targeted and focus-oriented um, communication. So it's not really one off an event, one, one time at a year. So we can really um, have a continuous dialogue with our customers and partners. Um, but definitely um, a virtual event cannot um, replace the, the life experience. So this is the other aspect. Due to the huge impact in the event and travel industry, we see that communication and a close collaboration and exchange with our entire ecosystem, with our partners and vendors is crucial because we need to ensure a consistent um, supplier base also for the future. And we need to get transparency and um, industry insights. Um, so we heavily rely on our partners and in our, on our ecosystem to really get um, information on the current market situation. 
overall, this is an unpredictable situation and it's still evolving. And as Matthias said, it's, it's not the same situation in every country. And um, so there are a lot of differences. And um, this shows that flexibility has become much more important than ever before. And this needs to be reflected in negotiations and in the contracting as well. So of course, the flexibility needs to meet the needs of every party involved. So not only um, for the vendors, also for the participants, um, the attendees of an event, and also, of course, for, um, for the host of the event. Yeah, so these are basically our observations that we wanted to share with you today. I'm not sure, Matthias, if you would like to add something or if I missed something. No, just, um, just yeah, thank you, Sirke. One thing that I want to um, re-emphasize is what you said. It is important for us to continue to working in a trustful um, partnership with our, with our vendors, mm -hmm. uh, including all the, all the CBBs that we have relationships with, uh, but that in, in transparency in the spirit of, of, of working together on a, for, towards a new normal. Um, so we, we, are, we need to be flexible and we require your flexibility as well. Exactly. And it really needs to meet all of our expectations. So it's, it's a relationship and a partnership. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Um, thank you so much for that. And as you uh, were able to listen to Matthias and Silke, this is really the corporate side of the world. So in this webinar, we're looking at three different uh, um, angles or three different parts of the meetings and events industry. Uh, we started with the corporate side. Um, I just wonder, in terms of the flexibility side, is there a, a, an example that you could share with us of what that actually looks like? Maybe a contract that you've put in place recently or something like that, uh, that you can explain what kind of flexibility you're looking like or what in an ideal world that looks like to you? Yeah, um, sure. I'm happy to share um, some experiences. So in, in the current situation of COVID-19, we had already existing contracts in place. And of course we have um, sometimes standardized termination clauses. Sometimes it's really an exceptional termination clause, but now we had to yeah, it was different scenarios. We had on the one side to cancel events entirely. Um, the second option was to really um, reschedule the event to a concrete new date um, next year, maybe. And then we had also some options that we wanted to postpone the event. That means we wanted to work and engage with the same partners and vendors. We have a clear plan that we want to go to this city, to this destination and this location again, but we don't know about a concrete date right now. So flexibility could really mean um, that we on the one side want to reschedule without additional costs or less costs, um, or we want to have the option to postpone it to an uncertain date and that the cancellation fee we would now have to pay would be calculated uh, or could be reinvested to maybe in 2021 or 2022. And um, another flexibility would also be um, in terms of virtual events. Sometimes we need the infrastructure. We need maybe a building or a venue to do the broadcast. So it's not that we may be use the entire rental space, for example, so it's less space, but we still want to work with this partner. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's a broad range of um, yeah. scenarios out there. Excellent. And you've seen, you've had examples where this has worked positively or you, you've been able to use that flexibility already. Um, Absolutely. And I can share my experience over the last month is that we had always fair communication, always very future oriented. It was really a partnership. So we, we saw immediately that we are all sitting in the same boat. So Excellent. I really appreciated that. Yeah. yeah. I have a question from, from Barbara, and I think it'd be great to just get to it quickly and we can always have a, a more deeper question and answer at the end. Um, she mentioned, you, you mentioned help with insights during your session. And um, do you have an idea? idea of what type of insights uh, a DMO, a destination marketing organization, can, can help you with? Um, from a procurement perspective, it would always help to see what other customers, what other corporates are doing. So um, to share maybe um, how they behave, um, 
how um, they engage with vendors. Um, of course, we cannot talk about contractual details, but the buying behavior, basically, of maybe other customers. This would help from a procurement perspective, mm -hmm. but um, it would also maybe help um, the events team to get other insights. So, Matthias, would you have any yeah. other ideas? Yeah, I, I agree. And um, we're in a situation where this is new to all of us, right? So, and um, on, the, on the last slide, we had something that we didn't really comment on. With, with this, that is, um, we, we always have to find a balance between between opportunity and risk, right? So you don't want to be the first corporate client to do a 10,000 people event with the risk of being a super spreader, right? But you also don't, don't want to be the last, right? So we have connections throughout the industry to our um, IT company peers, um, but it's also very important to know what is going on in other industries and what is going on in, sp in specific locations and with, with specific partners. And that's why I think, you know, especially CVBs probably as multipliers can, can help us understand what is, what is going on in this world. Excellent. I think that's a really interesting insight into how CVBs can help you. And it's not always the most obvious way, uh, but actually that kind of conversation, those relationships can be very, very important. Brilliant. Thank you so much for being with us. We'll have you on later on when we have our, our Q&A, our larger Q&A section. Uh, I'd like to move on now to uh, CC Lignu. I hope I'm saying that okay. Uh, who's really going to give us the perspective from the PCO, uh, responsivenesses, responsiveness and best practices in the meetings industry. Uh, CC is CEO Operations Development for PCO Services at AFEA PCO, and she's also here representing IAPCO. So we're delighted to have you. She's also one of the faculty members from the uh, ECM Summer School. So CC, over to you. We'd love to hear the PCO's perspective now. Thank you very much, Miguel. I hope you can see me, uh, hear me and see my slides as well. Okay. So it's my honor to be part of this exciting webinar representing the PCO side and of course the International Association of uh, Professional Congress Organizers. So as uh, coronavirus develops, our world has uh, experienced a time of crisis of risk and uncertainty. The so-called new normal has entered our lives very quickly and we had to adapt to an extraordinary period and a new reality um, in a vast way. The meetings industry have been, have, has been heavily impacted on various ways. Uh, so uh, in this very short period, survival, adaptation and change took over growth. Budget cuts, uh, cuts financial um, instability and of course loss um, replaced financial stability. Operation management was replaced by risk management and liability study. Our event organization process was transformed to a client consultation process. Logistics took over project planning as we um, um, focused mainly on uh, the changing of our events, the moving and postponing of our events, and fortunately also the cancellation of some of our events. Um, leadership, the leadership had to focus more on team motivation and, melt, and mental, mental um, support instead of personal devel development. And of course, uh, digital teams and technology experts took over. So our world has always been complex and colorful and full of challenges, but uh, for this specific period there was no manual, so we had to learn how to manage the change. Um, all across the world, the key messaging that came forward um, motivated clients, uh, the industry associations um, and uh, the world in general not to cancel but to postpone and to go digital. Various messages, communication strategies focus on those, on those key messages for the last period we have experienced. We have always used technology as part of our, of our events, but um, it is a fact that the industry, PCOs, associations, and our clients had to focus vastly on entering the digital world in a very, very quick way. So we tried to turn to virtual, and we managed to turn to virtual, um, which means that um, the majority of our, of our members, of the majority of PCOs managed to turn their events to virtual or hybrid. Of course, we're still in the effort of saving our national uh, meetings industry and turning our physical events to hybrid for the next period. Let's hope we will be able to do that, but the digital element came into our lives to stay. 
And I'm quoting uh, Dimitris Rusio, who is an entrepreneur and investor of TEDx Athens, who has predicted um, many years ago that the uh, technology um, will be part of our lives. And now he's saying, of course, and this is a fact, that the pandemic is a lifetime opportunity to embrace technology. And this is exactly what we did. So um, we as PCOs had to reinvent ourselves and uh, we had to focus on, 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 on new technologies, and new ways to bring our events uh, forward. Uh, we, of course, um, organized different kinds of events. So I'm just listing part of them and we had to completely change our focus. Different leadership models, intense need for speed education for our teams, role shifting of our teams from product management to logistics to risk, risk management to IT to tech experts. We, have, we had, of course, um, the opportunity to research on the diverse digital platforms. And in many cases, in order to deliver virtual events or hybrid events, we need to combine different digital platforms and overwhelming new data. And of course, investing in the digital content was key to bring successful events uh, into place. We had to learn how to engage our speakers and our faculty in the virtual world. Our IT people stepped up, of course. We had to in, um, activate production tweet, uh, teams, persuade the client on the value of the virtual um, congress, which is not always an easy case. Um, and that was a challenge, it's still a challenge. Um, and of course, we need to heavily invest in the human factor. Here's just a um, snapshot and vir uh, visual of some of the uh, successful virtual ev events IAPCO members have delivered, from Kenneth, CPI, ERA, AFEA, and um, many more just so you can have a look at how, how it looks like when you enter the virtual environment of a congress so what we had to do is completely shift our strategy and reinvent ourselves we had to react rethink rebudget redesign reinvent and in some cases even restart and this had to happen on various elements starting from leadership organization and company structure our people of course planning clients and ourselves now, the PCO has always been instrumental in delivery of a successful event, and now more than ever, we have been uh, able to connect the dots, and uh, we are um, a vital part of uh, the successful delivery of uh, any Congress. Our services and our expertise um, coming from the project management, event design, budget control, promotion, registration, all the standard practices, had to um, develop into the virtual uh, world as well. So uh, we invested heavily on the content management, speaker management, production team, as I said before, and we completely changed our on-site and online environment of the Congress. Now, as we're speaking about professional Congress organizers, and I'm here to represent IAPCO, I'm, um, I will try to present to you very short, uh, in brief, what IAPCO has done to respond uh, through this pandemic. So IAPCO, as you know, is the International Association of PCOs, representing more than, right now, more than 133 accredited um, members from 40 countries and over 9,000 event professionals. Through this pandemic and from a strategic perspective, IAPCO had, um, has developed a response strategy focusing on three main pillars. And these are advocacy, to promote the value of the meetings and the role of the PCO for the recovery process of, of the countries and the economies, to highlight the differences between mass gatherings and business events. It has always, it's still a case, and um, it, there is a complexity in trying to, to uh, explain this to the government and um, local authorities, and of course, use media coverage to empower and highlight the role of the PCO. Collaboration. We have been collaborating with all major institutions of the industry and have been sharing knowledge, uniting forces in order to build strategies for the future. IAPCO has created a strategic global task force with, um, I think, nine national associations of PCOs. HAPCO, my own, uh, as my country's Association of Professional Congress Organizers, is part of it. This uh, was a great initiative that brought forward and brought to the light. Um, um, how each country is dealing with the situation. Uh, IAPCO has a release, um, has a launch of press release on, on the results, and this is an ongoing process, and has been sharing knowledge through collaborations for the greater good. And of course, education. Uh, we took advantage of uh, the perfect time to launch uh, WebEdge, which is the online education platform of IAPCO, open to members and non-members as well, um, with more than uh, 40 modules, um, 
and very interesting topics for all event professionals. I'm, I'm urging you to visit it if you haven't done, done it already. Uh, we launched the Dialogues. This was a member-only project at the beginning, but there was a huge interest from the global meetings industry. So we opened the Dialogues uh, to the world and I'm uh, asking you to also visit and attend uh, today's dialogue. I will show you a little bit later what I'm talking about. And of course, education programs, webinars uh, from top speakers and education program programs for certain markets that have, have uh, expressed the need for that. So here you see WebEdge, our, our online platform, um, part of our yeah, our yeah for response strategy. Um, the global task force of national PCOs associations, various um, statements and key messages coming from the president of the association and uh, board members and key stakeholders. And today's IAPCO coronavirus impact, impact dialogue, which is um, happening in a few hours and you can you're, be my guest to visit it if you have the time. So um, it has been mentioned during a European Citizens Marketing Summer School uh, last year that we cannot manage what we cannot measure. So IAPCO is measuring on a yearly basis and we have uh, also launched an uh, impact survey uh, to our members. It's not um, over yet, it's still in progress, but I'm glad to already share some a pre release of uh, what our members are saying. So, through the survey, we have seen that 95% um, of our members have been offering virtual meetings, a very high percentage. More than 57% um, advise that 25% of the congresses will remain, hopefully, for 2020. One year from now, around 40% believe that hybrid, hybrid meetings will increase, and 38% percent believe that physical meetings will decrease by 10 to 25 percent. Of course, all of them are investing heavily in saving, in, in saving the, the national meetings industry. The crisis brings opportunities and now more than ever uh, the chance uh, for a collaboration stands and uh, we should take advantage of that. And we can uh, create um, various collaboration on both national as well as international um, perspective. But now, how can uh, convention bureaus, DMOs, and PCOs, industry associations work together? They can uh, work together on various task, task force, like the, the one uh, including the national associations. They can uh, create joint strategies to motivate ambassadors to bid for international events in the future and, and contribute into bringing physical events in a safe physical events, hybrid events, back very soon to engage governments and politicians in um, understanding the role of the meetings industry in the recovery process, to collaborate on a national or international level. Uh, we should use the case, the successful case studies of countries and of course uh, use the power of the media into bringing the message forward to the world. And speaking about case studies, here is just, uh, I'm just presenting some of, of them, like um, the collaboration of APC, ICA, and UFI uh, to present the, the requirements for the reopening of business events, various collaborations um, connected to the evaluation of uh, pharmaceutical events, virtual pharmaceutical events, virtual medical events. And I'm, I'm of course, very proud to speak about um, the example of, of my country, um, as Greece has been uh, a case study for the world on the way that uh, we have managed uh, the impact of uh, COVID. First of all, the health impact, uh, the impact on our health, and um, the fact that the Greek Prime Minister and all governmental officials are heavily promoting the Greek tourism and the safe welcoming of guests into our country. So this is an element that every country and any, every convention bureau, every DMO and PCO association should take advantage of and encourage the officials to promote the message. Um, we recently collaborated with the Athens and Thessaloniki Convention Bureau to, uh, um, to launch a study among all event professionals of our country in order to measure the impact of COVID on their business and in order to create strategies for a better future. And also our National Association of PCOs recently submitted um, the guidelines for the safe opening of physical events, which have been officially announced yesterday from the government and we are opening to physical event, hybrid events soon. So we're very happy for that and hopefully everything will be, will run well. 
So to conclude uh, some key elements, uh, first of all, nothing can replace the magic of face-to-face -face meetings. And this is the absolute fact that we should never forget and we should always protect. We have to learn to adapt, react and reinvent. And that's what we did in, collab in different collaboration models. We, of course, have to embrace virtual even more and transform our strategies, use the power, use and, and highlight the power of meetings for the recovery process, collaborate, as mentioned, and of course, invest in the human factor and take care of our people. That was it from my side. Thank you so much, Sisi. Um, I just wanted, I, I noticed something that you mentioned that I thought was very interesting. Just wondered if you could say a few words about that. You mentioned the um, saving the national meetings industry. Uh, and I understand that's more of a, a look inwards. Um, could you just say from a PCO's perspective, what that means? Uh, how, and not just what it means, but how is it different to what you would normally do? Uh, I think that would be really interesting. Of course. Uh, well, it is a fact that our international events have moved, have been postponed 2021, 2022, etc. Some of them have been cancelled. So as it is still very difficult to travel, we uh, should not forget that apart from the international meetings, we have the national meetings. For example, the national meeting of uh, surgeons, the national meeting of pediatrics. And uh, this means that only um, uh, participants come from the same country. They do not have to actually travel a lot. And, um, we can make um, the meetings happen. So um, we, are try we are trying to launch guidelines which will help us to organize a physical or a hybrid meeting in a very safe way on a national level. If, and that is if, different uh, to what you would normally do. You would normally not focus so much on that national level? Normally, our national meetings were not being in danger. Now they're still in danger. In danger, and, and I'm speaking about 2020 actually. And as 2020, in 2020, there are no international events. We will try. We are doing our best to invest in making the national events happen. Excellent. Okay. So, Thank you for clarifying that. I think that's that's an interesting point and an interesting kind of change of outlook. So we're going to move uh, quickly to uh, the association side uh, and Dermot Ryan, the account director of the KIT group for associations and conference management will be joining us and doing a short presentation. Before we do that, I'm going to do a quick sense check to make sure everybody's still awake and with us. Uh, and I wondered, uh, we, we heard from uh, CC that um, something like 95 of PCOs have been involved in organizing a virtual meeting. Um, and I wondered if you could share with us, if you're watching, if you're one of the participants that are watching in the chat, if you could share if you have been involved in also organizing in some sense, even if it's in a small part, a virtual meeting. And I'm not talking about a webinar, I'm talking about a virtual event with more than one presentation with things happening. If you have been involved, just write a quick yes in the chat right now. So yes, I've been involved. If you haven't been involved at all, if it's something that's completely foreign to you or not involved at all, just write a quick no in the chat, just to get a very quick kind of straw poll of who's been involved and who's not been involved. Okay, we're getting quite a few yeses come in. A few no's. There is no shame. There is no judgment here. Just a kind of an interesting uh, look at who's involved and who's not. I would say that the majority are yeses, but there's quite a few no's as well. So not yet as well. Okay. Interesting. Thank you so much for contributing. That is really interesting. It's interesting to see um, who uh, has done what. Uh, and I realize, you know, this may be completely outside of your job description and your job role. So it's totally understandable. Again, no judgment, but just an interesting to see who's been involved and who has not been involved. Excellent. Aoife even says a few more things about Tourism Ireland currently putting in place plans for a virtual meeting. Excellent. Thank you for contributing. Dermot, over to you. We'd love to hear from you the viewpoint of the associations and, and, and how they're looking at this interesting situation we're in right now. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Miguel. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, ECM, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be involved in this. Um, I am going to just say a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Dermot Ryan. I work for KIT Group, we're in a, a global PCO, IAPCO member, and also an association management company. So I work exclusively with association clients. And 
Uh, most of those are medical, so most of my presentation are go is going to be around medical meetings. Um, and I work on the conference management side, working with them on developing their events, but I also work on the association management side, so I kind of know how um, uh, me meetings fit into the overall association strategy. So basically this first slide really is earthquake. I mean it's really been a huge disruption for everybody. Some of the effects for associations have been similar to um, the, the, uh, the effects for most of our businesses, uh, business operations disrupted, a home office etc. Specifically looking at the effects for um, for associations. Um, the first main one, of course, is lost revenue. So we have to look at the various uh, revenue streams for associations. And most associations, on average, 40 to 60% of their revenue comes from um, live uh, events, face-to-face -face events. So this is a huge gap for them. Um, and there has been some revenue brought back, and I'm going to also discuss, of course, digital events later on. So they have gained some revenue. We're seeing digital events being monetized for the first time, which is quite often for a lot of associations, which is a little bit of a revolution. People are willing to pay for it. So that's a big shift. Um, but this is a huge uh, financial, uh, has a, had a huge financial impact on associations. And of course, if things don't normalize next year, it's going to have serious implications. Then just quickly moving on, uh, in terms of medical meetings, I think shifting priorities, all organizations have had to shift priorities, but medical meetings, uh, medical associations, scientific societies, I mean, their members are working with patients who have often have um, suppressed immune systems. So they've also had to put, put out a lot of information on advising their, um, their communities, basically, on how to uh, safeguard the health and lives of their patients. So they've been very occupied with that. Um, and also we have to realize their leadership, their volunteer leadership, they've got a day job. So some of them have been working, they've been on the front line of the COVID-19 crisis. They've been working, you know, 16 hours. They've been a day, um, some of them have been getting sick. And on top of that, uh, they've been responsible for, um, you know, the strategic survival of their associations. So there's a lot of stress there as well. Obviously, in terms of meetings, knowledge sharing, um, we have seen that face-to-face -face meetings are so essential to share knowledge. They can't be totally replaced by virtual events. And this has also been a gap um, for associations, of course, to try and fill. And finally, governance. I mean, it's realizing that the annual meeting or the biennial meeting for most associations is also a business meeting. You know, it's where their board and council meet. It's where decisions are taken on the future of the association. So with these meetings not taking place, they haven't also be able, being able to meet, uh, you know, to, to take the organization forward. So these are being taken place um, virtually, a lot of them. Um, sometimes these are very political discussions, which are a lot easier to do face to face rather than virtually. So it's just a whole new way of working for associations. And it's all been done really, really quickly. So risk, I mean, it's uh, the impact is, it is really is about risk management. And there's two elements here. Uh, one element would be to look at the short term risk. So the short term risk is forthcoming events. Uh, the priority of associations is to protect, you know, the health and safety and welfare of their attendees. That's working with venues um, to make sure that this takes place. And of course, all over Europe, there's different guidelines and um, on uh, restrictions, etc. So there's a different picture across Europe and it keeps on changing. So it's quite challenging. Um, so, you know, it's really, you know, we, we say, you know, there's a plan A, but there's like 25 other letters in the alphabet. So it really is trying to do scenario planning, trying to figure out what will it look like next year, and also what will it look like financially for us next year with different scenarios. And then long term, it's really looking at, um, as I said before, meetings are such an important revenue stream for associations. And I think associations have already known that they're very exposed to and dependent on the, the revenue from their face-to-face -face meetings. So it's really kind of looking at how they can diversify that risk. Um, there's various revenue streams that they have. I mean, traditionally it's membership, meetings, a journal, particularly if they own it, um, publications, and then other. 
Another we could say is corporate sponsorship, um, business activities, commercial activities, and also donations. And uh, the US associations have been a lot better it, with this sector. And I think uh, there's gonna be a lot of discussions in associations about how they can protect themselves in the future. So one of the things, of course, one of the things they've done is there's been a shift to digital events, um, as Sissy has already uh, spoken about. And uh, KIT, we've been working, KIT Group, we've been working on digital events for some time, of course, but I'll just give you two examples. Um, the first one is the International Union of Immunological Societies. So this is, you could say, a new offering. So they've been work, running weekly webinar webinars on COVID-19. So they've been responding their, to their community. So it's kind of almost created a new event because of the COVID-19 crisis. And then secondly, it's where face-to-face um, -face events are going digital. And this is an example from, um, here's an example from the International Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Diabetes where their face-to-face -face event in October uh, will be going digital. So that's, you know, I referred to an earthquake earlier. I think this is really a tsunami there's been so much interest uh, in digital events. It's been incredible. Um, we've, we've all had to run really, really hard to catch up. And I just also on the right hand side of this slide, just want to highlight this um, um, article from uh, the website of Science Magazine. Science Magazine is a peer reviewed uh, journal from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It's kind of interesting. They are talking, they're like, it's a scientific journal and they're talking about virtual formats and they're talking about the benefits of virtual formats. So I think there's two elements here. One, and it's ironic because I'm on a webinar, but speaking on a webinar, but you know, all our associations and uh, professors that I work with, there's so many webinars at the moment. They're all kind of exhausted by webinars coming out of their ears. But I think the reality is that people are more used to accessing content uh, virtually. They're just more used to it now. And I think there's more of an appreciation of it. And fundamentally, they're more used to speaking because some of them had never spoken um, in a virtual event before. And they were, some of them were kind of nervous about it, sharing the screen, you know, your slides, your internet connection. So I think people are getting a little bit more comfortable with the virtual events format. And of course, when we open up next year, uh, this year as well, to face-to-face -face events again, virtual events aren't going to go away and uh, it is a fundamental shift and just to finish i just want to run through maybe some trends and it's of course it's impossible to look into the future the situation is changing so quickly but i'll just talk about some immediate trends and maybe then just put my perspective potentially some future trends so in the immediate uh, term I mean, I think most associations are budgeting for fewer face-to-face -face participants. They think people would be less likely to travel. And they're also looking at reduced exhibition and sponsorship investment for 2021 because a lot of companies have travel bans until April, so they're not going to do anything. Uh, they're not going to expose their staff until April. Um, and they're interested in looking at, you know, also digital solutions, et cetera. Um, there's going to be tighter contracting to protect associations. So this is something that we're doing now. We're even looking at looking at existing contracts and seeing whether we can recontract. Um, cautious budgeting. I think every single line item will be looked at. And of course, this will have an effect particularly on social events, uh, food and beverage, etc. Those variable items that you can scale down a little bit easier. And this will have an effect, effect on cities. And I think digital event strategy for each meeting. So previously, some associations didn't particularly want to talk about having a digital event strategy. And it doesn't mean by digital event strategy that they're going to go hybrid. It just means, what are we going to do digitally? Are we going to record it and rebroadcast? Is there a plan B, et cetera? And then finally, looking further ahead, and this connects a little bit to the immediate issue. Um, I think attendees may be more selective about which meetings they attend. People have maybe got used to not traveling and found it not so bad. And this connects to my next point about sustainability. I mean, sustainability has been a really big issue, of course, in recent years. It's taken a backseat with COVID, but I think once COVID settles down, I think this is going to come back uh, and be more of a priority. We've, we've realized how vulnerable and fragile we are as human beings. And I think that's going to be filtered in. And I think cities that have done a lot of work already around sustainability will really benefit from that. 
again, I think industry may be more selective about which meetings they also will exhibit and sponsor. Um, they will look more closely about particularly face-to-face -face participation. Um, 2021, they will pull back a little bit and the danger is that they may, with all their competitors, may be happy at that level and may not come back to what they were before. Um, possibly a stronger focus on regional face-to-face -face meetings. This ties into willingness to travel and also sustainability. You know, as we all know, the national market will, re will return first and then the regional market and then international. But I think regional associations may have an easier chance and then connecting with a wider global audience um, through a you know, hybrid meeting. And one interesting point about the associations that have gone digital, European associations, I mean, they've seen a huge growth in their attendees of logically from outside Europe. So they've actually, a lot of them are global reference points for science, but it's just shown that their, their audience outside Europe has really kind of exploded. So they're, whereas um, it's a different, they're overall, they're getting more attendees effectively than they would at a normal meeting, face-to-face -face meeting. Um, I think we'll see increased cooperation amongst associations. Many of them are already cooperating on COVID-19 already. And I think maybe they'll begin to look at, and it really depends on how things pan out in the next year, look at co cooperating on meetings within some specialties. You know, there's competitions. They may look at, can we do joint meetings? If the situation isn't resolved next year, we may actually begin to see associations even being merged. And finally, again, about digital event offerings, I think what we've realized this year is, in some ways, how inadequate the current offerings are. You know, how can we engage attendees in a better way? How can we engage? And there's going to be so much learning this year. And this is all going to feed into the development of technology experiences next year. So um, this is certainly not going to go away. So that's my final slide. Thanks for your time and attention. If you want to follow me on Twitter, that's my Twitter handle. Thank you very much for, for your input. Quick follow-up question uh, while we are. You mentioned the... Um, revenue streams or I mm. guess sponsorship or exhibition or partnerships in some sense. Do you have any, any one uh, or, you know, specific ideas that, that you've seen be very successful in this kind of different uh, world that we live in right now? Um, well, I think at the moment, I mean, things are moving so fast. I think this is really more of a kind of a long-term question. So, I mean, I think logically the companies, uh, associations may begin looking at digital marketing possibilities um, you know, how they can monetize their digital presence a little bit more, be a little bit more sophisticated, take that a little bit more seriously. So I think that's somewhere. Some so the merging of go. associations with publishing companies or they sort of become one in some sense. Yeah, it is really about engaging. It's kind of like, how do we engage with our communities and our people? And one way, of course, is face-to-face -face events. Uh, but are there other ways we can do this? Perfect. I'd like to invite the other speakers to join me on camera. We have a few minutes left to do a little Q&A, so I'm going to bring up some of the questions that we've seen. And remember that you can use the Q&A to, um, to, to answer uh, the questions. Uh, there's a question specifically for Matthias from Guy Bigwood about sustainability. And I think it would be good. I think Dermot mentioned a little bit about sustainability. Matthias, would you be comfortable answering a little question about sustainability and how it sits in the new normal of event management at SAP? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Surprising question from you, Guy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think uh, sustainability, the original goals for sustainability were easily achieved this year, right? So SAP had the ambition to eliminate all single-use plastics from event this year. Done. Simple. Um, but in the new normal, um, what is what, what are the challenges for sustainability beyond physical uh, experiences is something that we're trying to figure out right now. Uh, it sits organizationally uh, within within my team in SAP, uh, and we're partnering with the chief sustainability officer and other departments on finding out what the new challenges are. So we learn a lot from IT, for example, from facility, uh, and how others tackle this um, this issue. So um, that's you know we don't we don't have the criteria yet. We're working on this and also working on. Um, creating um, a dashboard that will easily tell us how efficient we are in sustainability efforts where we, you know, since we can actually afford to put some more work into this in the course of this year with the absence of physical events. Um, Perfect. 
I noticed you also marked that you were going to answer a comment about yeah. hybrid events. Do you want to go move to that as well quickly? Yes, uh, also from Guy. So um, it is it, it is indeed challenging. But what um, what we keep um, referencing in this in this regard is um, a sports event, right? There are three different types of consuming the sports event, and the experience is very different whether you're, number one, you're sitting in a stadium, right? You're, you're chanting, you're meeting with your friends, you have a live experience um, and you're watching the game. So number two is you're watching it with your friends in a pub, you're not in the stadium, you still have the exchange, you're somehow remote, but it's a different kind of, it's a different kind of, of, of interaction. You don't have the crowd interaction, but you can, you can continue to include more information that you get from the outside because you're not as much distracted from your, you know, a phone, for example. Um, the third one is you're watching the game at home, right? So you get a lot more additional information. You can consume it at your leisure. You can stop. You can pause, right? You can take a break and then come back and continue to watch the game. Um, we are currently trying to figure out what is the right information that we need to channel through these individual uh, experiences for best consumption. Who who needs who needs which information in which way, and who also wants which information in which way. That is something that we're thinking about as part of the consideration for our future events strategy. But again, like I don't have an answer to this. I think it's the golden nugget that we're all looking for. Perfect. I love the, the football watching analogy. I think a lot of people can relate to that. And it's a very tangible example of different viewing. And also, where do you want input from, right? Normally, just the game comes in one direction. You don't have input from the people at the pub, but you could have input from the people at the pub, right? So that's when the hybrid becomes quite complex. We're running out of time very quickly, but I do did want to address the one more question that we had from Bettina, uh, a bit of an emotional plea in a way. Uh, it's a long question, so I'm not going to read it all. But essentially, she's asking, you know, provided that we can run safe events, there is still very much an emotional barrier. Uh, people don't necessarily want to take the risk. People may not want to travel. How do we, what is our role and how do we convince people to do that? Or should we try to convince people to do that? And I'll leave it open to any of the speakers if you want to contribute with this help to get people emotionally in a place to where they can run even smaller events. Mm. Well, that's the biggest barrier, this emotional barrier, and it's really difficult to get um beyond that. But I mean, all we can do is uh, prove to our attendees that we are professionals, we know what we're doing, and cities have a great, and cities are already doing a lot in venues, that there is a professional team in place, and it's the communication to reassure them. But getting them beyond this barrier, somebody who really doesn't want to travel, um, it's it's a challenge. All I would say is the world may be is changing continually. And in three months time, I went to my first business trip on Tuesday to Paris, my first since February. And really two months ago, if I never traveled again, it wouldn't have made any difference. And I quite looked forward to when I came up to my trip on Tuesday, I was quite looking forward to it. So I think it's a, it's, you know, I think over time, this pressure will ease and, and people may be able to get over it. Excellent. Cece, any comment from you? Yep. Yes, of course, if I may add, it uh, depends on the country, of course. It's the fact that nothing will be the same. The meeting formats will change for the next couple of years at least. So we need to accept that. But um, exactly as Dermot is saying, if we convince our clients that we have the safety measures in place, that we are the professionals, that we have all that, we can bring all the dots together. And if we include our countries and our governments in this process to convince the clients and the attendees, I think. Um, in time, it will change. We get there. So, okay, Matthias, anything you can share from your side? Um, I can. I can just say. I think w right now we we can just give. We, we plan to just give our our customers the choice in the future, um, and as I see, there's a. There's a big push, especially from from Asia, to go back to physical meetings as as soon as possible. Right. So I think it's going to be a balance between, you know, what what is what what is what is possible, what do people want to do, and and what can we, what can be, um, what can we afford to offer, right? Um, I don't have, I'm sorry, you know, perfect answer to say this is the best way to convince them. I would maybe say, you know, try to make sure that not everybody understands it's safe. Right, have a, um, a clear concept for the safety and security and health, 
um, and the rest will most probably follow. As the first meetings get back on, everybody else will follow. Yeah, I agree to that. Yeah, I think we can only provide the, the infrastructure and the concepts that everything is really safe and in place, but we cannot really convince individuals. So um, exactly. the measures need to, to convince them. So really, I hear a balance of putting things in safe in, 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 in a safe way and creating the environment, a safe environment, and communication is very important and, and cooperation to make that happen. And I think everybody here believes that once it starts, then, then there'll be a, a kind of domino effect and then things will just start going. But it'll, like Matthias, I think you said early on in the session, you don't want to be the first necessarily. You don't want to be the one taking that big risk. So it's uh, it's all a bit of a balance there. Excellent. I want to thank all the panelists, all the speakers very much. I know we're running slightly over time, but I wanted to um, make sure we ended on that uh, note of hope as well and, and support for each other. Thank you, ECM, for holding this um, webinar. I hope you found it useful. And I know we're going to close off with a video uh, that I believe uh, Julie is going to play. It's just a video about what Pier Paolo mentioned right at the start of the webinar, which is the online edition of the um, events that is normally called the European Cities Marketing Summer School, but this year will be a slightly different event. So have a look at this video. If you have another two minutes, uh, enjoy and goodbye for me. Thank you very much for watching. And I look forward to connecting with all of you uh, again in person, hopefully soon at the next event. Thank you. Thanks goodbye. everyone. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. I'm going to go to the next one.